Uh, thanks for joining joining me, um, Sade. Um, we we're going to chat today about um, your experience with the Kosovo refugees um, back in 1999. Um, so why don't we kick into um, a little bit about your background, and then I want to show you um, uh, some some of the research I've been looking at, some of the original source material, and I want to sort of gauge your your reaction to that. So why don't we start with um, you telling us a bit about a bit about how you got involved um, uh, in volunteering to help the refugees, um, you know where you live now, and what your motivation was in in getting involved in helping the Kosovars, and what exactly you did. So let's start there. Yeah, thank you, Robert. It's nice to be here mm -hmm. and to reflect back on that journey, which was a long time ago now. But uh, my name is Sida Ramadani, and currently I'm working in remote Aboriginal communities uh, in Warburton at the moment. Uh, with community projects of various sorts, so ma managing the development of a social enterprise out there. Um, so my heart and passion has always been in community development work, and I go between Western Australia and Northern Territory and Melbourne at the moment, so <laughs> no fixed place. Uh, and the way I got started is I was actually 19 years old, heading into an accounting degree and profession and working for um, uh, a tax organisation. Yeah, so I was uh, an accountant, but I was always volunteering and actively involved in the Albanian community of New South Wales. It was a very, very small community, and we had a little committee that ran a lot of the community activities. And it was a way to keep uh, the Albanian community gelling together, maintaining the culture, maintaining the connection um, to the homeland, and um, trying to yeah just just keep um, that closeness and connection. Um, and we had a little club, an Albanian club in Chester Hill that was run by our community leaders and we'd go there every Friday and it was a lot of fun just hanging out with other Albanians. Um, what, happens and, there, what happens there on a Friday, Seda? Oh, on a Friday the, there'd be music, so there'd be singing, there'd be um, uh, families coming together, pool games, so there was a pool table and badly fried chips, but no one went there for the food. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was, it was a really nice place just to hang out. It was sort of like, Albanians um, do a lot of visiting between people's homes and this was a way to have a lot of people in, in one, one home. And, mm -hmm. um, so, and um, during that time, the, the tensions had been um, unfolding back home in Kosovo. And I'm from Kosovo originally, but migrated to Australia when I was a young girl with my family. Uh, and we were all uh, constantly glued to the TV. So that club became a place where we were all sitting down watching or talking about what was happening in the homeland. And as you can imagine, everyone had family or friends uh, affected by what was going on, on there. And we were hearing first accounts of um, a lot of the tragedies. And, at, and sometimes we weren't hearing accounts because of the closed um, communication loops. And so just sitting there debriefing, worrying, and the feeling of helplessness, uh, not knowing what we can do but everyone was eager to help so there was a lot of fundraising campaigns going on and there was a lot um, the community was very mobilized uh, to help and i'm talking that our community in australia comes from macedonia albania uh, kosovo and other areas so in the diaspora we're, we're very connected even though religiously and uh, sometimes even uh, um, uh, geographically we, we can be very different even in dialect, um, but everyone came together wanting to help. And so, so um, I imagine there were a lot of different roles that different members of the community played. Your brother, I was reading about tape um, um, in the so I remember reading in the sources when I was researching my book. Tape's name came up because of um, a number of excursions when he led um, some of the Kosovo refugees around Sydney. Um, yeah. which sounded like quite a, quite a, a nice um, day trip or a few day trips. So what was your role? at? Um, uh, you were based at the Sydney um, East Hills Army Barracks. Uh, yeah. So what exactly did you do there? Yeah, so uh, once the community mobilised, we became, the, by default, the volunteers of Operation Safe Haven. And our role as volunteers was, to be honest, not well explained to us. So we did anything and everything. We became cultural advisors. We became interpreters. Um, I remember being on national television 
uh, when the first group of arrivals came at, um, at the airport and all this media with flashing cameras and, and microphones was on me. And I was 19 years old at the time and they're like, what, are you, what is going through your mind? What are your views about this? And I just was like, what, what the hell? <laughs> um, so our role was really, uh, I think we had probably one of the most critical roles in connecting the, um, the Kosovar community of refugees with the, um, all the different NGOs and services and the immigration department. Mm. So there were three, I remember, I still remember those three colors of jumpers. So the volunteers had the yellow jumpers. And I think that meant you were bilingual. And that was really what our role was, bilingual support. And then we had the green jumpers, which meant immigration. And then there was, I think, the red jumpers, which was health. So mm. it was a bit of a triaging of who was what in the, in the volunteer and working yeah. area. Mm. Um, so as I said, yeah, our roles were random. And um, I remember being at that first day of those first arrivals on the 7th of May, 1999. And they said to us that it would be three months. And then three months turned into six months. Six months turned into 11 months. Mm. And um, a lot of these Albanian community volunteers had, had given up a lot to mm. come and help. So uh, for, for me, I can speak personally, um, I left my accounting job and I left my accounting degree because the, the de not just the demands of volunteering, but our willingness mm. to help and maybe to fulfill our own need of guilt and wanting to do more and the helplessness. Um, and so, you, yeah, so I was spending like 14 hour days working at the refugee resort, resource East Hills Barracks. Yeah. It sounds like quite a, um, a um, well, personally, quite a, um, <clears throat> a lot of resources you had to bring yourself to that, to that, 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 that role. Did, was yeah. there any sort of support offered um, financially or in, in kind? You know, was any accommodation offered when you had to maybe, you know, um, leave East Hills? I imagine some of you would have had to have gone to Singleton or, or other yeah. places to, to perform those roles later on. Singleton, yeah. for those that don't know and are tuning in, um, is quite a distance, about 200 kilometres from Sydney, I, I think. Um, so it's a couple of hours from Sydney, Australia, inland, um, and can get quite a bit colder in the middle of the year, which is exactly when the, the Kosovars arrived there. Um, so were you given sort of support from immigration or, or maybe charities or, or other organisations to do your role? Yeah, it's interesting because when Operation Safe Haven was developed, it was pretty much an overnight preparation. And the model they used for developing Operation Safe Haven was called the DIS plan, which was the disaster plan. Mm. And I guess disaster plans and um, the Margaret Piper point, points this out in her reviews, Disaster plans are meant to be short term. You come in, you, you sort out like floods or fire damages or things like that. You come in, evacuate a community, um, triage the healthcare needs or whatever. And then, but because this went for 11 months, the disaster plan model didn't actually um, work as effectively as they thought. So uh, for example, with the, with the volunteers, we, um, like I said, we were quite critical to the whole process, but we weren't involved in, the, in those planning um, environmental conversations mm. and so we were just getting piecemeal information about what to do and where to go and um, it was uh, it was like uh, uh, no fault of anyone everyone was trying to do their best but it was we weren't sure none of us knew how long this was going for or whatever mm. um, but we just did the best we could and we'd get up every day and it was unpredictable every day so mm. a 14 hour shift for me might have looked like uh, rocking up at the clinic and then um, uh, sitting there and waiting for uh, patients to come in and mu there were multiple patients you can imagine very very complex mm. needs and there'd been a lot of um, like people didn't have access to health for a long time or they'd been at the refugee camp in Stenkovac and so there's a lot of medical things going on and then you'd be called in to do interpreting and there was no training for us to be interpreters and I know now because I'm a qualified interpreter that it's a it's a it's a skill set that you need training in. So not just confidentiality and um, you know speaking in I statements with a client, but um, knowing your medical lingo and knowing. I'll give you one story, um, and it's a story about this man who had an earache. Now the word in Albanian for ear is vesh, and the word in Albanian for kidney is vesk. So sorry, I, he had a. I can see where going. Yeah, he wanted, he wanted his, uh, his kidney out and got an ear off. <laughs> yeah, he, he actually had a kidney problem, sorry, not an ear problem. 
And so the interpreter went in and heard Vash and said, oh, he's got, uh, the, this patient's complaining about an ear problem. And so there's this patient being inspected by the doctor in the ears and going, oh, well, I guess this is how they do it in Australia. But at some point, another interpreter came in, he goes, this old man, I don't know why they keep looking in my ears. My kidney is really hurting. <laughs> And so yeah, that sounds frankly quite hilarious. One of, one of the issues um, I, I looked at a little, just a, a little bit in the book is um, about the, um, there were two, two things I was thinking about when you were talking just now. Um, one was the, only a handful of translators were on the books for Department of Immigration. Um, uh, so, so definitely there was a, there was a lack of, available and Albanian translators at, at the government's disposal. Yeah. Um, the other thing is there was, a, towards the end of Operation Safe Haven, there were particular phrases in the agreement that Kosovo signed um, before coming to Australia, the agreement that stipulated they understood it was temporary and they'd be provided certain services and, and then they'd have to uh, leave after um, a couple of months. Uh, whether uh, and, and you've described a, a, quite a funny incident where it has been a lost in translation, even with the translator um, involved. Was there something? Was there something? Um, something else in regards to the language and the translation experience that had quite serious implications that you remember? Um, not so. Not so much with the language that I can remember right now, but. Um, I do remember that uh, there was when the, the whole signing of that document that this was temporary safe haven. Um, I suppose when you're in uh, Stenkovac refugee camp and you're given an opportunity to come to Australia, you'll sign anything. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, the, the temporary thing, uh, some of the community members, so what happened is um, East Hills uh, barracks were starting to reduced in size, Kosovars were starting to leave because um, Philip Ruddock was saying, okay, your, your bout is over, it's safe to go back now. And even though UNHCR, United Nations for High Commissioner for Refugees were saying, don't send them back, that, that Kosovo's not ready, um, they were being sent back. And um, also because uh, the East Timorese refugees were then starting to come in, so the new phase of uh, safe haven, uh, they asked some people from East Hills to relocate to other communities, like you mentioned Singleton or Bandiana or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a resistance from one old lady and she was not very well. And she said, mm -hmm. no, I don't want to go. And um, so I guess the lost in translation there was that a story that was about an old lady that said, I don't want to go because I'm really sick and I want to stay at East Hills. And she'd become settled there. And you can imagine some of the manifestations of trauma and settlement. She didn't want to change again. Um, there was uh, a really negative response to that lady mm -hmm. from the media, from the minister, from <laughs> saying, uh, so I remember the articles in the beginning of this process being, so we love, you know, you, the refugees, you're welcome, you're safe here. And then this happened. And then there was a bit of a, um, negative turn it's like you you should appreciate that we've given you this and why are you resisting so this this incident where this lady spoke up very innocently mm -hmm. became a real like it escalated very quickly mm -hmm. and uh, not only um, in the non-Albanian community but even in the Albanian community there was a, a negative reaction going you're, you're embarrassing us you're you know mm -hmm. um, you're, you should just go and do what they say so there, uh, it was um I want to tease out this dynamic of, um, and I do a little bit in the book, this idea of there's this language of uh, uh, you know, ungratefulness or, or you yeah. know, we should be visibly or publicly grateful for what we're being given, um, despite some of the services being regarded by the UN, for example, um, as somewhat inadequate. But, but that's a somewhat side issue. Yeah. What I really wanted to ask you just now was um, when we met a few weeks ago, um, um, when the former president of Kosovo visited Sydney to, yeah. to part of a film launch um, uh, here uh, for the Global Women's Summit, you one of the first things you said was um, Australia was um, um, one of the first countries to, to stand up and, um, and welcome and invite the refugees here. So, so what do you think changed um, when yeah. this happened? Yeah. Like you might remember I told that story of... Um, 
so the air, they had um, the first landing was at an airstrip which was like designated for the refugees mm -hmm. and mr john howard our former prime minister at the time was there to greet the first plane load and an old lady stepped out and she was wearing her shamia her scarf and her coat mm -hmm. and in um in the preparation documents that had been given to um to the uh, uh workers and the staff it said it's not appropriate to um, embrace the opposite gender. You can shake your hand or put your hand on your heart. And this old lady came out and John Howard went to shake her hand and she went in and gave him a big hug. <laughs> and so just, that threw all the protocols out of the window. Yeah, from, um, from first contact is gone. Yeah, from yeah. first contact. And when um, w the buses were there to pick up uh, all the refugees, they were put on the buses and then it was green lights with motorcades all the way to East Hills Barracks. So they had, um, the roads were emptied out and it was, Along the streets, the streets were lined with Australians saying, we love you, welcome to Australia, Kosovo is your safe now. And it was this really warm reception. And I remember the refugees themselves being so moved by, by the affection and the warmth. And, um, and you're right, sometimes I guess, uh, when, you, when you put a whole group of people that have come from war together in one East Hills barracks, which was the processing center, there were hundreds of people there. Um, we didn't understand at the time, but trauma manifests in so many different ways for people, you know, and, and like this example of this old lady resisting the, the decision to be forced to move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I remember the initial media reports, and you probably read through them, was all warmth and affection and, and um, you know, welcome, we love you. To, and then in the end, when there were some that didn't want to go back home, when, when they were saying, your time's up, safe haven's over, if it was temporary, you go back home, um, the media articles turned sinister. So they were shaping the views and opinions of, um, of uh, everyday ordinary Australians by the way they were writing these articles. So there was the Welcome Australia signs. Next minute, you're seeing people go, why aren't they thankful and grateful for what we've done? And I guess it made me reflect a lot on what gratefulness does, what it looks like to people. And I felt in some ways, like, as long as um, you remain, like, maybe what people's perception of a, a refugee is, like a helpless victim, Mm. Um, that's okay, but if you start to speak out and disagree, and we've offered you this, mm. then you know you're no longer <laughs> welcome. But the biggest shift happened. I think I think Australia's um, refugee, from from my personal experience, support of the East Timorese and Kosovo refugees, mm. and that's my lived experience, was so different to the attitude we see today globally, mm. and the yeah the 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 hate not hatred but maybe intolerance of refugees or mm. we've never seen another safe haven since and i don't know if september 11 had something to do with a lot of the shifting dynamics and perceptions but mm. i i just feel like it was a different time back then does that make sense we did no i i i would agree and um one of the um the exceptions to that would be um when the syrian and iraqi refugees were were brought to Australia in 2015, if I remember correctly. And once again, we saw the repetition of media support for evacuation, um, or, albeit the um, Syrian and Iraqi refugees would be offered more permanent um, uh, resettlement, you know, circumstances. And the Kosovars were only offered um, short-term temporary uh, safe haven. Yeah. We once again, though, got political leaders standing up you know, in the frames with the, you know, the first few Syrian refugee families in Australia in the publicity shot with the, you know, with the Premier of New South Wales, for example. So, so I want to, on that point, I want to segue into some of the media sources um, to gauge your, what you were thinking at the time, at the very beginning, the very, um, I guess we can put these five sources in it, in the, in, under the, um, sort of heading of first contact so i want to take you back there now if you don't mind um and what i'm going to do is share screens um and let's hope hopefully this will work um so let's see how this goes so i'm going to start with um an image in uh in the macedonian uh, refugee camp this was published on the 7th of may when the first refugee flight had actually landed already. So I think the press was catching up here. But this is the, uh, a group of refugees leaving the Macedonian refugee camp 
um, on a bus from which time they get on an aeroplane um, with a connection in Rome and then on to Sydney. So I wanted to know what, what you were, were thinking at this time when you saw the, they're coming, they're finally leaving, they're on their way. Yeah, um, it's, I have to go back and think about this time, but um, I just remember out here um, spending many late nights at the Albanian Community Centre, um, really preparing for becoming volunteers in the best way we can, but we, I guess we weren't prepared for what, we're gonna, what we were going to expect and the stories we were going to hear. Um, but at the time there was, um, what, what would be a word for it, like the anticipation feeling of, um, I guess feeling like we're finally able to contribute to something and, and support our people, our families and friends. Um, and that, you know, he being in the diaspora, um, that we can actually help make a difference to some of these people's lives. Um, what we, I guess, despite even being Albanian, I can only speak for myself, but what I didn't prepare for, um, and this photo gives me the chills, you know, just remembering some of the faces. I haven't looked back at a lot of this stuff for, for good reason, you know. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of fun and good stories, but there's a lot of heavy-hearted things. And when I look back at this photo, I, re I just remember the individual stories and um, the war stories and experience that some people did and some people didn't want to talk about. Mm. And the media was hungry for information and they were um, uh, constantly like trying to approach ref the refugees and go, what was war like? And what was, and I remember interpreting in some of these moments and, um, and a lot of Kosovars were politely responding and, and one man said to me, um, what should I say to them? It's war. I don't know what to say. I don't really want to talk about it, but I feel rude. Mm -hmm. And, um, and people just didn't want to talk about it. But even for us, we wanted to know about it. What, what's happening on the ground? What, and then I realized very early on um, just that actually people who've been through war, they don't want to talk about it. Because to us, it's, it's a, there's a distance from the stories. But mm. what people saw and can never unsee in their lives. Mm. I remember one um, little girl, she would sleep with her shoes on. And, mm. you know, and I spoke to her one day and I said, oh, you know, like, because she was getting counselling through the trauma and torture support services. And they discovered she was sleeping with her shoes on in case she has to get up in the middle of the night and escape, even in East Hills, you know. Mm. Um, and there were kids and, and girls that, um, when leaving the, ho the home, when they were being um, evacuated during the war, they put mud on their faces mm. in the hope that they wouldn't be picked out to be um, sex slaves, mm. you know. And there was a lot of... Uh, war crimes around, uh, you know, sexual assault and rapes during war as a form of, as a, a form, a weapon of war. Um, yeah. And so those things were horrific, you know, and um, we just weren't prepared uh, to understand the, the depth of people's pain and suffering there. And I guess you were saying before that, um, you know, you were, you were thrown in, and many of the community members were thrown into you know, the volunteer situation and perhaps some of that training you mentioned might have, you know, how to, how to respond to trauma and what, what else you need, um, you know, in a, in a safe haven environment, um, whether it's counselling or, 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 or other services on hand. Um, so let's, let's move forward now to the next uh, photo. So this is an image of the, um, the front page of the Daily Telegraph um, on the same date. So this is the, they're in Bangkok. Um, so what were you thinking here and how were you preparing your, yourself, um, adding to what's been said previously? Yeah, this was, um, I think this was the, the final hours of us preparing. And this is probably the point where we were literally getting our yellow jumpers. And um, <laughs> there, there was uh, preparation in that practical sense. We were getting our jumpers, our ID badges and, feeling very proud. And um, I remember at the time also, I was 19 at the time, that I was doing a lot of uh, media interviews and just uh, became some quasi spokesperson um, mm. in the community. And um, at the time, I remember feeling grateful that I could speak the language and that I, I was useful. And I remember 
when I was growing up, my parents would be like, speak Albanian in the home. And they were very strict about that. And I was like, hey, I want to learn English. And I'll, <laughs> I'll see you later. I think, I think the, um, the audience for Refugee History UK might not be entirely aware that Australia is, uh, has a lot of different languages spoken at home. Um, yes. And, and Albanian isn't one of the main or major language groups in Australia. Um, but, you know, and, and the main centres of, of Albanian communities are Sydney and, and Mel Melbourne's probably got a bigger population, hasn't it, um, than, than, than Sydney. So, so that's a really fascinating um, uh, bit of detail there. And, and you, you instinct or your family um, ensuring you spe speak Albanian growing up and then, and then this, this happens and then you are able to contribute. Um, yeah, you're playing those values. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's move well, on. Also, sorry, just one quickly thing is um, how close knit the community became. Like we, everyone just put their best foot forward, and we were always at the Albanian Community Centre, like preparing um, even donated goods and things and gifts for the refugees. Um, there was uh, like a, a such a positive unity uh, there, and and that changed along the way because of everyone yeah. sharing grief and yeah. yeah I guess we were experiencing vicarious trauma without knowing it and without understanding that it was yeah so your the way that you saw your community changed through the through the experience and it became something maybe something else or something something it had morphed it had kept its you know its core and then maybe developed into a new yeah. sense of itself a new identity do you think that that has continued to evolve 20, 20 years later is the community um, and its stories and its identity has it shifted somewhat in the last twenty years? Yeah, it's it's shifted a lot, and I would say that is one of the most defining times for the Albanian community because there was um there was the I guess pre-refugee migration population and post-refugee migration population, mm -hmm. um, and the the established community members, like I said, were so mobilised and mm -hmm. active and helping and. Um, I, I think none of us, from the leaders to the volunteers, none of us understood the burden of responsibility that was going to be placed on us. Mm. And that during this time, we're going to hear some horrific stories. We're going to um, go through those motions. And as an interpreter, you speak in I statements. So you even start taking ownership of some of those stories. Um, you know, like if someone says, I have a sore belly, you say, I have a sore belly. And, and in more horrific um, counselling scenarios, you were hearing a lot of, war stories of people's uh, things that you just never imagined would happen during war mm -hmm. um and so the community uh, together we were mobilized but individually we were all going through a lot of sorrow mm -hmm. and we had no debriefing you asked earlier about support and debriefing we had no debriefing um a lot of us were doing this as volunteers so we weren't getting paid <laughs> and we weren't getting any financial things so the the, the drive was always to to help mm -hmm. um and then we were spending 14, 15 hour days, you know, inappropriate hours as a volunteer mm. at the at the center. And I think we were all going through a lot more than we were expressing. And so then the community started to become fractured and um, and, and then uh, people were taking sides and sometimes gossip would brew up about uh, different people. And, and it just became a, like a hotbed of a lot of people just manifesting their, their grief and what was going on you know in different so ways sounds like, it, was tough. Um, it was tough on the community it was really tough and yeah. it's it's yeah now there's a new generation of community leaders um that are leading the way and we're still very close-knit community and um yeah. you know it's, it's great to see that but there was a period of hardship for us you know and um and it sounds like that that sort of debriefing you mentioned before would have would have gone quite a long way and you know um when you have Immigration yeah. staff, I imagine, um, and UN um, staff having access to debriefing services. Um, everyone, else, everyone else had a structured organisation they worked under, and we were the yellow jumper volunteers. We were mm. like, we didn't have a, a real leadership structure around us, um, so there was no organisation that was looking after us. Uh, but and we had, we were working the 14, 15 hour days. While we're looking at this. Um, I, I wanted to continue that discussion about the structure. And, and there were, from what I understand, there were community leaders like Eric Loger um, yes. who, were, who were in a, um, 
sort of midway point, uh, unofficially or officially, um, you know, given the status of um, negotiator or with the government or, or broker of, of, of the peace, in, for, what, or for lack of better words. Who were the sort of key middle people um, that you remember and what was their contribution? Yeah, so um, Eric Loga was uh, definitely a, a standout and he was, he was a wonderful leader in the community. And in Sydney, we had um, a lot of our community elders. Uh, and if I name a few, Sadiq Binake was um, a key member and Hilmi Ramadani, my dad. And um, there was, uh, I'm just trying to remember, and, and El Fadochi. Uh, so, and in fact, um, I remember the women taking a lot of leadership responsibility and they were doing a lot of things and coming in to visit the refugees and um, provide that friendship and support that in some ways only women can provide to other women. And, uh, mm -hmm. and um, they'd sing and dance together and share stories. But um, the women in our community, and I'm talking about the, in our community association, um, also did a lot of fundraising and got really active around um, supporting the refugees here and here and overseas. Mm -hmm. and they raised a lot of money towards that. So, um, you know, I I have to say, like I say, I think the the Albanian community during this time was so critical, and I think um, they they put so much aside to help help with the refugees, and and it was such such a wonderful contribution that they made. Um, and to, and you know, it sounds like each part or different parts of the community, you know, um, grouped and then, then contributed yeah. what they could in, and, you know, using the, the skills or resources at their disposal, um, yeah. help the refugees in very particular ways. So what do you, yeah. when you look at this photo, um, what, what were you feeling? Do you remember um, this is the moment when the Kosovars, the first plane load, um, of Kosovo refugees stepped off the plane and John Howard, our Prime Minister, was there to shake their hand. And, and yeah. what were you feeling? Where were you standing in relation to this photo, do, do you recall? This is when they're coming off the plane. Um, so we were, so the plane was in front of us and about maybe 400 metres down, we were all lined up. So the yellow jumpers mm -hmm. and the green jumpers and the red jumpers. Mm -hmm. And um, and the media was right there just filming everything. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the first thing I remember, the two things I remember seeing, and even before they got off the plane, the kids' faces on the windows of the plane, and just these big eyes of just taking it all in, like, uh, oh, and I think kids, kids understood we're safe, you know, we're here, we're safe. They were so excited. And the second thing I remember is, and I can see it here as well, is the hollow faces of a lot of the older community members, and and just that um, that first look of people who've come from from war, war, and um, you can see, like, yeah, like there's a there's a man in the middle there that stands out that has um, quite a hollow face, and I just remember physically going, wow, like, mm. you know, a lot of these people have been through a lot of suffering. Um, mm. Yeah, um, we were emotional, like, cry. All of us were crying, and we were just, all of us were just uh, astonished, and. And reading these articles, there was such a beautiful acceptance and support and um, it just the whole of Australia was behind us, you know, so we felt a, like a real embrace from Australia mm. for our people and that was quite a nice attitude, you know, that the media also played its part in influencing, yeah. And all of a sudden the Albanian community becomes, you know, is in the spotlight um, and, yeah. and certainly... Um, you know, a, you know what is a Kosovar, um, and, you know, and how is it different to Albanian? Suddenly, the, you know, the the group of um, the group known as the Kosovars were here, and who were they? And, and as I mentioned before, the you know Albanians are, aren't aren't exactly a a large ethnic group in Australia, and let alone the Kosovars within that, um, even smaller. I want to just quickly flip to um, the next one here, um, which is the uh, processing stage so the day after or the, the days after the Kosovars arrived um, they went to the East Hills barracks and this is some of the photographs captured in the Sydney Morning Herald so, yeah. so what were you um, what were the first few days like for you and was there a sort of element of making it up as you go along absolutely it was yeah. all of that I mean um, 
those first responders, the volunteers from um, uh, the charities, and also the, the clinic, it's the first time I'd seen nurses and doctors in action. And we were taking our lead from them. And they, they are obviously so good at triaging and, and processing. So people um, would come and you can see the, can you see the little numbers? So everyone was being registered. Um, so they have their, their numbers. And that, um, that image, uh, I think that one threw me a little bit when they were getting the numbers because I was like, oh, they're becoming just a number. And they had to wear that all the time. But a lot of the kids took pride in that and they loved having their number. Eventually they got numbers, they got a photo, uh, I think a photo as well um, and their name on it. But um, initially that was a bit, um, I guess, I don't know, it, it undid me a bit just seeing people have numbers on them, but they would all carry them around their thing. And they'd be given a, a pack and you can see a little teddy bear there, the, the Red Cross teddy bears. Um, that everyone, everyone was given, all the kids were given, that they loved, they were all donated. Um, and there was, despite the short preparation time and the use of this disc plan, there was such a structure of triaging. So um, there were people that needed, um, I think, uh, injections and just treatments if there was any tuberculosis or any of those uh, communicable diseases going on. There was treatments immediately available. And, um, and it ran so smoothly. At some point, I remember just watching this process just being... Um, you know, just running smoothly from table to table. So they'd, they'd get their identification sorted, then they'd get their packs to go home with, which had certain things in them. I can't remember what it was. Mm. Um, some food packs as well. And then uh, the clinic treatment and triage. And then uh, everyone would be given a, a dorm. Um, so East Hills Barracks was set up for uh, the army, the military. So they, they were dorms with bunk beds in there and whatever. So everyone had their own little room mm. um, set up. Let's, and, uh, let's talk quickly about the the next one because that relates to where they were sent and and um, uh, the the sort of things they experienced at different barracks. Yeah, yeah. So this is the um, well, this is preparing for the arrival in Tasmania. Um, uh, and I think this is in the the Sunday Telegraph. So wow. the, Bright, the Brighton barracks, just to describe where that is for for those. Um, not familiar with where Tasmania is. Tasmania is, is the island off the southern tip of Australia um, and Brighton Barracks is just um, outside of the capital of Tasmania, which is uh, Hobart. So what were you thinking at this point? So what kind of concerns did you have um, about sending the refugees you just met and you just sort of, you know, brought into your care? Um, what were you thinking as they were leaving or about to leave? Yeah, it was really sad because, um, like I said, you're spending 14, sometimes 16 hour days out there and um, spending a lot of time talking and communicating with people and hearing their stories. And you feel an attachment, healthy or unhealthy, you develop an attachment with people. And um, yeah, I remember just it would, the, the vibe would change in East Hills as, as people would come and go because East Hills was the central processing center. That's where all the initial processing happened. And then people were being relocated to other barracks to uh, where they more or less were settling into a more, you know, just regular everyday life. But can I say this? And you mentioned Singleton Barracks earlier. Singleton Barracks became, uh, w was one of the places where people were uh, not wanting to go because they got attached to East Hills and they got com comfortable and in the routine of things. And, and there was a lot of um, refusal to go to Singleton, this place inland of Australia with not much going on there. And, um, and, but the people that went to Singleton Barracks, it actually became the model area for, um, for how it should have been run. And that Singleton community became the example that they used as where the, the, the Singleton population just banded together and their support of the refugees was extraordinary. For example, there was a young couple who was getting married at the Singleton Barracks and the local wedding shop donated the dress and the jeweler donated the rings and um, another community member donated the hall and everyone came together to support this, this young refugee couple getting married. And was there um, was even a horse and cart, wasn't there? The, <laughs> yeah, there was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, um, and then us at East Hills, where it wasn't, none of that was happening at East Hills. It was this processing centre and 
In fact, um, some people got focused on just the speed of the process that it became a stopwatch situation. Mm. Whereas in, we, were, we were envying the East Hills. So my parents were at East Hills and they had accommodation there and they were um, helping with the bilingual support. And they loved it there. And they were, you know, the, in, the, in the end, there were some uh, Anglo-Australians from Singleton who actually sponsored some of the refugees to remain. And uh, when it came for the refugees to leave, it was the Singleton community, this tiny, mostly Anglo-Australian that had never been exposed to <laughs> refugees, suddenly was, you know, like in the front um, of the trenches fighting for these people. Wow. And when the last of the refugees left Singleton, they developed a memorial and they had everyone there from immigration, the volunteers, the Kosovo Albanians, they came in and, and I think every few years they all, uh, they all come back to this memorial then they meet. And so, so these smaller um, areas, Bandiana, um, uh, maybe Tasmania as well, the communities there actually fared, from what I understood, they fared better, they were much closer. And, um, and uh, we still- Singleton is a real, in, in, the, in the book, Singleton is, it's a real ano anomaly in the story. In one sense, it, it was really central to that backlash you mentioned before. Um, yeah. when the, there was a bus sit in protest and some of the refugees didn't um, uh, didn't think very highly of the services there. Um, but then you have the community as an example of um, what many as other Australian communities did, whether it's down in Paka, uh, down in uh, Bodonga or Bandiana uh, in rural Victoria, um, whether it's in Port Sea, the southern tip of Victoria, whether it's in Perth or, or Adelaide, um, a real sense of at the grassroots level, there was a real um, continuing deep connection to this idea of being generous to, 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 to the Kosovars and being part of that, that sort of historic, um, albeit temporary, um, point in time. And just, just for those that are interested, where, where is the memorial in Singleton exactly? Um, I, I have a photo of it somewhere. I um, honestly can't remember exactly where it is, but I can probably write it down for you if that's okay. That's fine. Uh, yeah. I had a photo here I wanted to show you of that memorial, but it's... Oh, here, here it is. It's on... Um, it's on a slide, I'm sorry, because I, I once did a presentation on slides. That was back before technology. Um, if I don't know if you can see that there. I can, yeah. yeah. So you can see there's a map of Kosovo down there. Yeah. If you just a little, back, pull it back just a touch. Yeah, I can, yeah. yeah. And there's a little rock there. And down the bottom, there's a map of Kosovo. And then I think people wrote their names around the rock there. And there's, a, there's an imam. And I believe the uh, immigration people, and there's, there's my mum and dad, um, and they, they all came together um, and, yeah. and built this memorial. So I've got to find exactly where it is, but mm. that just shows the camaraderie of small communities, wow. you know, and, wow. and such a beautiful closeness. To this day, there are, um, you know, I'm talking ordinary, everyday Australians, you know, the, the, <laughs> that have never, never experienced anything outside of Australia. Yep. Just this suddenly contacting people in Kosovo and they continue to this day to maintain that friendship, you know, and wow. Uh, that, that it's hard to describe in words. And um, yeah. um, I don't know if you've got time, but I want to tell you a quick story as well about this young family here. Sure, yeah, go for it. You see this little boy and he's got a little patch. Mm. And this family doesn't mind me sharing this story. Um, so there's a little patch there, which is a bandage, okay? Mm. So this family was... Um, one of the last families to, uh, so when, when the minister said temporary safe hands over, this was one of the last flights to leave Australia. Mm. Um, and people were being offered um, some financial contribution if they were to leave um, to, to get help. And so this family was prepared to go and they were fine. And um, they got on the plane. And then uh, that young boy had a, had a temperature on the plane. Mm. And the pilot, the immigration department's like, all right, it's done. The plane's loaded. Let's go. And the pilot's like, I've got a kid with a temperature. Mm -hmm. And the immigration um, at the time, from what I understand, I can't speak for immigration. I shouldn't speak for immigration. But at the time, everyone was keen to just get this plane to go. Mm -hmm. And the pilot refused and refused and refused. And, and, um, and I remember saying goodbye to all the Albanians. And then I was driving off to go back home. And I was crying because it was mm -hmm. the last 
group of people to go and it was very very emotional for all of us mm. and because the pilot refused eventually th th they had to give in and pull this family off the plane because the pilot said i want this kid checked um they ended up checking this boy his name's albion and he had um uh, and they called me and they said you have to go to randwick hospital we've got a kid with a temperature and um he had meningitis oh wow and so if he if that pilot didn't stand up and say i'm not going to fly this plane the kid might possibly have died on the flight that's what the doctors told us and so this is saved, another example of, of the haste at which the australian government in many ways wanted to give to to send the cost of ours back which yeah the opposite attitude um you know and and you know from the start of the story it was the generosity let's welcome them here and then essentially yeah. very hasty um what the un uh called an induced return um um that right? Yeah. Right? that's that's right rather than um voluntary re repatriation which is what the the refugee convention requires um, so that I didn't know that story. That is that is fascinating. It's a very moving story. There is post surgery with um, the nurses and uh, the nurses at Royal Randwick were Royal Randwick Hospital were so moved by this kid because he was a real warrior. You know, he was very much um, he had to have fluid removed from his brain, and that's why he had that little patch. So he, he, fully, so, he fully recovered and um, fully recovered, and wow. I met him fifteen years later, and he's a he grown broke. man. Did he go back to Kosovo? He's gone back to Kosovo yeah. and he's um, living, a, you know, a good, healthy life. And, and you know, like to this day, we all appreciate that pilot for, you know, it's easy to go with the flow and, and just feel that pressure to, to do things in the haste, like you say. Yeah. But that individual pilot made, was the difference between life and death for this little boy. Um, What's, um, what did you, do you know the pilot's name? Maybe we can find him. Oh, see, so these are the things that, uh, when I was going back through my, my memories, I'm like, I wish I kept more diary notes, you know, and it's easy to say that now, but at the time, 16 mm. hours a day, you're just really in survival mode all the time. And by the end of it, you haven't got time to keep anything. But I wonder if we could trace back that flight and yeah, work back. Find, that, that find out who it was. That he'd be him with him. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it reminds me just quickly, um, of another story about a bus, the, the, the bus driver um, at the Brighton Barracks in Tasmania who, who sheltered um, at least one of the Kosovars who, who went on the run from the authorities. Oh, yes, um, I I think he was living in his bathtub or something, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> to, to wrap things up, and it's been fascinating chatting to you and, and meeting you for the second time. I can't believe we've only just met just a few weeks ago. But what advice um, would you give to other volunteers um, today as far as getting involved in helping refugees? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, look, I have to say, without a doubt, that um, my normal changed from that time. Um, the person I was and the person I became later completely changed because of the way I worked in in positive ways and as I said I was 19 years old and I look back now going I can't believe I was 19 years old and the, the way I was working the things I was doing I, I get intimidated by now by the fact that I spoke on national television then and just had such but I guess what I learned is when um, when you need to draw your strength and courage and resistance and persistence, you do, and it doesn't matter what age you are. Mm -hmm. But the advice I would give is exactly that, is um, that expect your normal to change. And for the rest of my life, I've been significantly affected by the stories, the work, the personal, um, just the personal suffering and firsthand accounts from people's lives and living through war. And I heard countless stories that are horrific. Um, and, and like I said, they, they didn't know much about vicarious trauma then, mm -hmm. but I know it now, having worked in community development for a long time, and, and I know it now to be vicarious trauma. And to this day, there are still things that happen. Like for years later, there was a Nokia ringtone that would make me just jolt and jump out of my seat. And eventually I had to 
change that ringtone because it was a memory to being contacted all the time for support, counseling, get to the clinic, you know, interpreter, we need you, interpreter. We were never called by name, we were called interpreter. Um, and that, um, you know, volunteering you do because, because of your heart. There's no other drive for it, you know. And it's your heart that gets fulfilled and equally gets shattered um, just by the work you do. Um, but I meet some of these uh, refugees today and some remained in Australia, you know, and I've even gone back to Kosovo and reunited with this little boy who I spent a lot of time with the hospital with them. And the, the, the memories they share with you, like I don't remember a lot of the stories because you just wipe some things out of your memory, but they go, oh, you bought us hot chips in the bus when we were, you were taking us to the clinic and it was so nice of you because it was a cold night and it was hot chips with gravy from the service station. And, and the little things that you do that were insignificant and you didn't really feel any, and people bring this up 20 years later and you, you go, gee, you know that. Um, this, you feel, this is one element um, I, I unfortunately missed out in the book is, you know, um, my book looks at the macro sort of narrative and the government's um, yeah. and policy and what the media was saying and the policy makers and the lawmakers. Um, but I've, I think a natural extension of that is to go and talk to, you know, the, the people like yourself and the, the refugees um, mm. about the, what made their, what, what, what is the, um, the basis of their sort of collective memory, but also their individual memories yeah. of that moment and the gravy and the chips is um, yeah. one of those stories. And um, there's a few that pop up in the book, but not as many as I'd like. So I think we'll, um, we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much, Saida, um, for um, chatting with us. Um, and um, if there's anything else you wanted to say to, um, to the Albanian community while, we've, while we're doing the broadcast, feel free to shout something out now. To the Alba are there Albanian community members in the audience? Well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will. I will say in my language, you, you Persian das and Gazemra Jitschiptar. Like say hello to all the Albanian community, and um, and um, thank you for your questions, Robert. Like I said, I haven't revisited this stuff in a long time, but still talking about it, I'm getting goosebumps from some of those med memories and articles, and I think some good questions you asked there that um, took me back on a journey. And um, yeah, I, I hope that um, I've been able to just uh, enlighten some people and on our individual experience, but I really appreciate them, the time and yeah, talking about I, it. I appreciate your time as well. And I think we, we could talk all day. There's just so much to, to go down memory lane with this. this. Yeah, yeah. Thank well, you. Some fun stories. <laughs> thank, you. Well, th thank you again. And um, we'll hopefully chat again soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.